Thank you so much for, for being here today. I'm very, very excited to speak to you all um, about one of my favorite work tools, uh, which is LinkedIn. Actually, it is the only social network I'm, I'm active on. Uh, I was resistant to social networks for the longest time, and I still am. I literally have zero friends on Facebook. Um, <laughs> never went around to that. And one of the reasons is because obviously I, I don't feel too comfortable sharing um, much about my personal life on the internet or period. Um, and LinkedIn is, at least the way I use it, much more a resource and a work tool, a platform to share network and get access to interesting people that I need for my job rather than a social network. So I'm gonna explain to you a little bit how I came to use it that way. Um, and actually I had earlier on somebody ask me, uh, you know, I, I really want to uh, move into a new department uh, here at Berkeley. I am interested in developing my career a little bit in a, in a different discipline. Um, is it useful for me to come to your presentation? And uh, my answer was, okay, well, imagine you send in your application and the hiring manager Googles your name and finds your LinkedIn profile and goes on your LinkedIn profile and sees, oh wow, you're already connected to five people in my department, and oh wow, amongst those five people are the dean and associate dean. So do you think you'll get that interview or not? So that's the idea behind it. And uh, the reality is you might get that interview not because the hiring manager then goes to the dean and asks, hey, do you know that person? Is it good? It's like if your dean is connected to that person that sends an application, it's pretty much uh, a person that you want to invite because at minimum, your dean thinks that that person is valuable enough to be in their own personal network. So how did I develop this or these methods for LinkedIn? Um, I've worked in Europe for seven years in business schools, uh, mostly in Paris, and I was in charge of international programs um, as uh, academic director, as director of international relations, and I helped hundreds of students over the years to figure out how they can develop their careers internationally, and that's a super tough thing because you need to basically apply to jobs in companies uh, that you don't know in countries that you have never been that can be 10,000 miles away and you need to figure out how you can actually create a connection with these people so that they at least give you a chance to interview with them. So today I use this um, skill set or these methods um, very successfully in my job here at Berkeley. So no, I'm not corporate LinkedIn. So whew, this is not a sales pitch at all. <laughs> Yeah, it's like the first thing this morning, like I come in and say, oh, you're doing the LinkedIn thing, so you're from LinkedIn? No, I'm with you guys. Uh, so um, I use this very successfully because I'm in charge of international initiatives at the uh, extension department. The extension department, um, we do continuing education. We give access to uh, people that are not matriculate students to the excellence um, of the faculty we have, but we also reach out to uh, industries and business to bring in instructors from there. So basically we are the connector between university and the real world, if you want. And uh, that means that for my classes, for events that we organize, for company visits, for uh, talks, for seminars, I need to be able to find people across disciplines, across departments, and I need to be able to find people in companies all around the Bay Area. So I use uh, my LinkedIn network to do that and it works very, very well. So I wanna walk you through three steps how you can actually, or that you need to go through if you want to do this development. Um, but I want to back up at the beginning a little bit and ask you, um, do you actually know what LinkedIn is? Um, or maybe who has LinkedIn? Okay, everybody has it. So now the trickier question, who has more than 500 connections? Okay, there are a lot of millennials there. Um, <laughs> um, but also, you see it sometimes with seniority, you, you are in a position where you can actually just get a lot of um, requests, and I think uh, the faculty, uh, we totally own this place uh, in terms of LinkedIn connections. I'm just approaching my 6,000 connections. Easy, 
Like if you lecture for several, several years, uh, all your students are connecting with you. And if you're in a good university, it's great because that is like amazing network for free. <laughs> so uh, we have that advantage. But you can actually build that network out uh, even if you're not necessarily a lecturer. So it means that in this room, there's a lot of people that kind of signed up for LinkedIn, but then you kind of more or less use it on and off. And maybe it's important for you to actually realize the, the basic functioning of LinkedIn and how you can use it. So let's take a very simple example. So this is actually a research example of, of network strategies where I just use their very simplified network to illustrate how that can work. So imagine I'm Tom or you're Tom uh, or Tina. And you want to, uh, or you saw two job postings, super interesting, one at the School of Information and one at the College of Letters and Science. And uh, you're not connected to any of these departments at all. Um, and you think, according to what I just said earlier, well, I should get connected to their associate deans or deans, so to John or Rob. Um, John being in the School of Information and Rob being in the uh, College of Letters and Science. So. I need to somehow get connected to these guys. And I'm at the NOW conference. So I'm going to start networking. And at the NOW conference, I meet Alex, who is actually in the um, School of Information. And I meet Kate, who is in the College of Letters and Science. Great. Now, imagine that College of Letters and Science would be my first choice. And I try to get connected to Rob. If you look at this network, according to you, which person or which contact, Alex or Kate, would be most effective for me to get connected to Rob? Any of them, OK? Which one would be the faster one or the more effective one? Alex, OK. Why Alex? I mean, you just count the connection points. Alex is connected to Anna, to Julie, to Rob, so that's two in betweens. Kate is Roy, uh, Mary, and Mark, so that's three people. So the people say, okay, what does this have to do? I don't understand anything, huh? <laughs> <laughs> this is how LinkedIn works. Alex and Kate, if I connect with them uh, via LinkedIn today, become my first contact, so my friends. So all of their contacts, direct friends, become second level connections to me. Now there's something special about a seven, uh, second level connection is that Anna, for example, now sees that I am directly connected to Alex if I send her a connection invitation. If I go to Anna and say, hey, um, I'd like to be connected with you, send her an invite, what she will see is, oh, there's another person working at UC Berkeley. Interesting. Maybe I should connect. And especially, oh, I know Alex, and um, Frederick is connected to Alex. Uh, he's a really good guy. He's very serious. So if it's a person that Alex trusts to have in his network, then I can trust that again, uh, that person as well. So imagine I connect to Anna at that point what at the beginning are my third level connections. So if I'm just connected to Alex, Julie's a third level. I have no link to her. If I connect to Anna, Julie becomes a second level connection. And then the magic of LinkedIn is without ever having talked to Anna or met her or without even ever meeting her or talking to her, if now I send a connection invite to Julie, she'll have the same reasoning. She'll be like, oh, Anna is a very serious, good person, and she's uh, directly connected with Frederick. Well, wow, that must be a good connection to have, and there's a very big chance that she'll accept my invitation as well. And the story goes on up to Rob. If Rob really trusts Julie, and I'm friends with Julie, if I send Rob an invitation, he's very likely to accept it. So with that game, basically, I can go ahead and connect my way through Rob, which would be faster through Alex, even though he's maybe not in the same department, than it is through Kate. Now, if you look at John, which connection is more valuable, Alex or Kate? Or to, through which connection can I be more effective in connecting with John from School of Information? 
So both have only two people in between, right? The only difference being that here I only have one path, basically, or a longer path through three, whereas here I have two paths. So given the fact that somebody might say at some point, okay, I don't know that guy and will not accept them, uh, his invitation, which happens, the probability of going through Kate to get to John is higher because here I have twice the chance, quote unquote, to get there. Now, if LinkedIn was as easy as this, it would be great. We could totally strategize our way through exactly where we need to go. The problem is, basically, after the first connection, we don't know exactly what is happening. Sometimes we can see um, second connections and then we can start strategizing. Third connections becomes very complicated because we don't know who's the friend of a friend to get there. So basically, the method that we have to use needs to be flexible enough um, and broad enough to be effective despite of the fact that we will be shooting in the dark. At some point, we just start developing a network and we don't know exactly where it's going. At the end of the day, these are the people that we are targeting. How does that work? Three steps. The fundamental step is build your profile in a way that you improve the chances of actually being accepted. So this connection, and especially then the connection to Anna, needs to happen in a way um, that is, how to say, as probable as possible, meaning that Anna will never meet you. So the only thing that you can relay on, rely on is your connection to Alex. And then if your network, uh, sorry, if your page, your profile page is complete rubbish, it's a little bit difficult to even trust Alex. <laughs> Maybe that was just a drinking buddy of him that he accepted somehow in a wild craze in an evening. So I'm, I'm still a little bit dubious. So this is um, a fundamental thing that you really want to go through. And um, if you have had LinkedIn seminars on how to build your profile and blah, 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 this will still be very interesting for you for a simple reason, that is that this is built um, after several years of work with people directly from LinkedIn as well as recruiters in many different companies internationally. So this was a big part of my job, as I said, for several years, is to figure out what our company is really looking for. So the first thing that happens if somebody Googles you and finds your LinkedIn page is that they have this, these two cases which they see about you. And it is really built in a very strategic way by LinkedIn to mirror what happens if you meet a person in real life. It's the first seconds that allow you to get an impression about who that person is. Most people don't go beyond this when they look at your LinkedIn profile. And you really have to understand it as this. This is your one shot, 10 seconds, make an impression. So it's actually pretty simple to build this out. In theory, in practice, it might require a lot of iterations of you to do it. Um, by the way, it's not vanity, the fact that I use my profile as an example. It's really just that I've done this so many times and I've tried every time to do an engaging thing with people in the audience or whatever always messes it up because I'm de deconstructing this thing and criticizing and so on. So if I do this on myself, uh, it's okay. If I do this on another person in the audience, I always get bad feedback. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I prefer to do it on my own. By the way, headshot. Headshot is, uh, you know that we have Andy here who's taking headshots today. Um, he took this one and just took another one. I'll see if that, uh, the other one is better. Um, but definitely make use of, of this opportunity. We actually have this uh, opportunity here at the conference um, because it allows you to uh, do a headshot that is conform with what you actually want to represent. The headshot is the same thing as meeting a person uh, in real life. If you meet somebody um, that is dressed in a way that doesn't resonate with your normal environment or the environment in which you feel comfortable, you will not necessarily connect with that person very well. Or in other words, when I was back in France in business school, my headshot was super slick, stern, tie, suit, very professional business. If I still had that headshot here, the only people connecting with me would be Wells Fargo bankers in San Francisco. <laughs> Nobody from Berkeley would accept any invitation from me. So coming to Berkeley, we're all friendly people. Um, I mean, 
in a director position, you would expect maybe a shirt or something to be a little bit more professional, but the main message is like, I am actually a nice guy, so don't worry. So this is what I want to show in my um, profile picture. It is that impression that I want to give and this impression that resonates with the environment in which I am. And this can be really targeted. You can have a headshot that people feel comfortable with applying at the, I don't know, School of Information. If you're applying at Haas, might not be exactly the same uh, headshot. How can you find out what headshot would be good for a certain domain or industry or department? So, exactly. Look at what they are doing. Just look at a dozen or 20 profiles in that department and so on, and you'll get a very good feel about what the people actually look like, the types of pictures they post from themselves, and the first check is for you, do you actually feel comfortable in that environment or are these all crazy people <clears throat> that you think is maybe not a good idea to apply for that department? Or is it really something that resonates? And if it resonates, then well, do something similar. Do something that you feel comfortable with and that will be the exact same parallel to meeting a person in person. If, a, if we get along right away, if we see that we are on the same wavelengths in terms of how we present each other, we feel comfortable, that's how a connection um, starts. The second thing is the background picture. The background picture is like a big pain um, because it requires a lot of introspection actually. The background picture uh, seems like just an unnecessary gimmick but psychologically speaking it's a big part of the first impression that you can make. Um, it is supposed to illustrate your ambitions, what you want to do with your life, with your career. So in my case, I'm in continuing education. So having this citation, which is from our campus in San Francisco with the whole um, of life from the moment you are born to the moment you die is a process of learning is exactly what I'm most concerned about. This is why I work every day, why I get up. This is what I want to do in terms of academic innovation and development. I want to be part of this. This is my ambition. Um, there's a lot of things out there and information and blogs that tell you, oh yeah, you have to be like the standard, um, how to say, uh, interview, uh, how to say, uh, messaging, um, power, empowerment, success, and so on, like word clouds and so on. <clears throat> Doesn't really work. It's here really not about impressing anyone. It is a true reflection of you, what you want to be. Not necessarily what you are, you might be just in an entry level position or something. It is about what do you want to contribute? What are your ambitions? This is what you put in here. And it's actually the same thing that you have in the about section. The about section is probably the most difficult thing on your whole profile because it is more like the about section that a company has on their web page or the university has on their our web page rather than oh, I have studied this and I'm doing this and this is my job and just listing the different positions that you had. This about page is really to take in that sense of about. It is what are you all about? Why am I getting up in the morning and doing what I'm doing? What motivates me? What drives me? What are my career ambitions? From the manager perspective, I read the about part as what will you bring to my team? And if that matches with what I need from you or what we do in our team, where we are going, then that's perfect. So this is very unsettling for many people if you never have done that level of introspection. And this is the same thing as mission statements of companies. You know that there's a lot of traditional companies that their mission is make money for the bosses. Very difficult to come up with a mission statement that is like, no, we want to change the world and impact and blah, blah, blah. They can't do it because they, that's not their mission. So for yourself, it is a hard question to ask. It's literally what do you want to achieve in your life? What is the impact you want to have? What is your day-to-day -day all about? This is what needs to be in there and it can totally backfire. If you do it well, it's brilliant. Uh, people will see that you have thought about it, you know what you want to do with your career, where you want to go. If you do it badly, it's there. Black and white, written out there on the internet. 
you don't know what you're doing with your life. <laughs> so that's... <laughs> So it is tough, and I can tell you it takes a lot of time. A good technique actually to be not maybe too risky is actually to update this and to refine it maybe once a month or something, like just go back to it, review it, re read it, retype it, have other people read it. Same thing with the background picture. Don't do this as a standalone exercise where you're just with yourself. It's based on what you want to do, but it is important for you to have this as a back and forth and have people give you uh, honest feedback about what is the impression that you get from here. Don't go to the people that just tell you, oh, this is all awesome. Go to the people that will just give you honest feedback. <laughs> I don't want to dwell too much on this, but I can tell you that it takes me forever to write this. Believe me, it's, it's, it's not an easy thing. And at the same time, um, it works very well, if you do it well. The same, yeah. If your official title doesn't match what you do, um, it's actually not that much of a problem as long as you figure out how to frame it in here as what you want to do. So you still need to put your official title in yeah. Part. Yeah. So, you know, most of the time in your career, whatever you do is kind of just a step to the next thing. So, if you read, like, I mean, it's super small here, but um, what I've written at the moment is my team and I drive global study pathway design a paradigm shift in higher education worldwide. Um, this is something that we are literally on the edge of development. It is a new concept where instead of um, bringing professors to the here and teach the locals, we actually leave the professors in the ecosystems where they are very effective in their universities and we build partnerships and pathways around the world where students can hop from one place to the other so that they are with the best professors in the best place during their study path. And so that's a very recent development and we're just at the beginning so it's not the major part of my, uh, of my job day to day but this is where I want to go, this is my ambition, this is what I want to build. So if your job today is not exactly where you want to go, doesn't matter. The question is what are you about? Think about it again as a company. That is, uh, for me, the, the easiest thing. Like if I'm a company and I really have a mission, um, or I'm an NGO, I'm an organization, I'm a university, I have a mission, what am I about? This is uh, basically what you have to think about as the CEO of me. What are you about? This is what you want to put in here. Other questions? Or, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there, there, is this, there is this fashion of people coming in to LinkedIn and actually not putting their title, but putting like influencer speaker, I'm crazy about, I don't know what. For me, if I see it as a manager, the question for me is, will you be working in my team that has a certain mission um, in the position that I want you to work? So I would say there's a confusion between this is very millennial and uh, the, the new thing is very Gen Z in the sense of people thinking this is really about me and this is a poster of me and this is Instagram, which most of the time it's not. Um, the idea here is millennial in the sense of I'm putting out all my cards blank on the table, on the internet. This is my ambitions. This is what I can honestly contribute to your company. If you think this works with you as a hiring manager, fantastic, because I know we'll get along very well. And this is why I put it on the internet, because then I can apply to many, many positions and many people can see this. If you take it the, the maybe even more Gen Z or Instagram way of just trying to promote yourself beyond what is realistic, um, that is something that the the companies will pick up on as well, and I can't create an honest relationship. The key word here is the authentic profile. And it actually gets, um, it becomes clearer if you go into the, the parts that the managers then look in as a next point. So if I see that your mission, your values align with mine, and you're probably a good fit for my team, I want to know what you actually are able to do for me today. And that is very important in your description to understand that what you write in your experiences 
is not what you have done. It is what you are able to do now for your manager in the new position. So you have to explain how today you're able to contribute. In this case, for example, I describe very quickly um, what I do and what extension does. But I focus or I frame it in a way when I say it that I am not just saying I'm the director of, or uh, I'd always students say, oh, I was a sales assistant in whatever. I don't know how good you were doing your job and I don't know what you were doing, so I don't know what you're able to do for me today. I need to frame it in a way so that uh, the next employer knows what am I able to do as soon as I step through the door. So if I write, for example, um, my main focuses in my current position are designing and directing innovative study programs for continuous education, they know that the, I am able to design and implement, ideate and make happen. If I write that I'm able to direct, they also know that I'm able to work with different people. If I put in words like innovation, they know that I'm able to take risks and work with risk. So at that point, if I describe what I'm doing in this way, like active with adjectives and so on, they understand what I'm able to deliver today to them as soon as I leave this position. Make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So the first question was, is there a difference if I send it to a human or a machine, <laughs> basically? Yeah. So basically, in, in your question is already part of the, the answer is um, you, the first step is to build it out in a way that you just literally reflect what you're able to do today. So you can, every position, if it, even if it goes 10, back 10, 20 years, you want to write, what does this allow you to do today? So what competence have you um, achieved? From there, it's very simple if you want to optimize it for recruiters and machines um, because you have specialists in this. So you would pay 250 bucks to a company that based on the sector you want to work in just puts in the right keywords. It's as simple as that if you want. And you, there's no easier way um, because you trying to figure out what is the latest keywords is just a waste of time, I would say. Um, the second question was about um, how do I frame this over the different yeah yeah so the I can cite a recruiter from uh, from Facebook when uh, somebody asked uh, the recruiter so do you actually look um, also at the LinkedIn or do you just look at the resume and this basically the recruiter was laughing out loud saying like what is a resume <coughs> So um, the, the reality is that usually before it comes to uh, recruiters um, in outside companies in business, it goes through a lot of machines. And so basically they look at your LinkedIn and you'll understand a little bit down the line of my talk um, why. And um, in terms of balancing it, what you have here again is your profile. That's your personality. This, it should mirror what happens in a personal discussion. So it is what you're able to do, whereas in the resume, that's something you might target a little bit more specifically for that position where you put out the points that are most important, most relevant for this. The reality is that um, probably any good um, manager will just Google you, find you on LinkedIn and, and look at this. And this is where you need to just be very, very aware that you cannot oversell yourself in your resume and your motivation letter, because they will look at your LinkedIn, and if that is not coherent, then you lose out. So the idea is to illustrate your competencies and skills um, in this, and you can also use examples. Please don't describe a long example, but what you can put is something like this. I'm actually developing strategic global study pathways. 
that is an example of what I'm doing. I'm developing this and this. I'm managing that and that. It can be as short as one sentence. That already is a concrete example. As compared to a very generic, generic I'm directing programs or I'm coordinating programs and so on. I don't know what you're doing. Okay? The next point that um, recruiters or managers usually look at after having seen what you pretend to be able to do <laughs> is how much is there a bite behind your bark. And this is the activities and um, the articles. So ideally for you, you use this very, very wisely. Articles and activities are your portfolio with which you can illustrate what you're able to do. Think of it as an artist coming with his or her book of drawings to the, to the potential employer or to the potential um, gallery. This is your portfolio. Here you show what you actually have done successfully. So articles are really a beast. It's the same thing as the about part. If you're able and you can take the time to write an article about something that is relevant to you according to your ambitions. So for example, I write articles about innovative ways of how we could improve um, education in certain fields, continuing education. And I really do a fair amount of uh, research for that. I can spend uh, a whole weekend doing this and I have to reread it and double check it because if a manager reads one of my articles, there's a ton of mistakes, which is usually what happens with me, uh, like spelling errors and so on, um, or uh, it's not well written, there's no clear argumentation, there's no logic in it. Well, that's me. I cannot hide it. This is like blank cards on the table. Um, it can either work very well if I do it well, or it just proves to the manager that I'm not good. So. Articles need a lot of um, uh, work, and this is why you don't need to publish them really re very regularly. It's very different as a social, uh, from a social network. It's not about constantly satisfying your fans. It's building up a portfolio. So these articles, um, you can craft them, and even if you don't publish one for another six months or a year, it's not a problem. They are out there, and if they're well done, people will see what you're able to do. Um, you can also see postings and repost them. However, again, it's not a social network. If you are spamming the world with reposts um, that are, I don't know, uh, funny rabbits uh, or, or cats or whatever, which unfortunately happens already on LinkedIn as well, people will not respect this and they will not see your contribution to it. So for example, if I repost something, usually it's because I'm connected to some groups or some companies, for example, the World Economic Forum, and I see a very intriguing, important um, uh, video or contribution from them that I want to share with something that I can add to it. So there was a video about China um, electrifying their cities, and I thought, oh, they don't mention this one 500,000 people city in China that's completely electrified already. I should share this as well. So in my post or repost, I have a whole paragraph on how great I find the initiative. I love also this one city that you might want to read up on. And here's why the Chinese are doing it, because they're preserving big parts of their nature and video. So there's a real contribution of myself to that repost. I'm not spamming, I'm contributing, I'm enhancing the discussion, so I'm showing what I'm able to do. Be very careful when and what you post, because the AI sees it, if you have a, a software scanning, or the manager sees it. So uh, you run the risk of giving the impression that LinkedIn is all you do during your day. <laughs> And this is a real problem. Like there, there's, you would be surprised to what extent uh, LinkedIn can measure this, and managers are susceptible to this. Uh, HR people as well. They can literally see when you're posting this, and if it's not in the morning or during the lunch break or after work or on the weekend, then it's a problem because you're posting something during work. The only thing you can actually post during work is if it's in relation to your work. So for example, uh, in my team, um, I have people that work on events, uh, custom programs. Uh, Luis in my team is developing a career development program. And so he uses this very strategically to um, promote himself, to build up a portfolio of, uh, to show what he is actually able to do. <laughs> so for each event that he organizes, 
He takes pictures that document what is happening, how successful it is. He puts it out thanking all the people that were participating. And that way, he's able to actually promote his achievements very well. And so any hiring manager that looks at his profile has factual data. Here are events organized by him with very important people that he was able to bring in, the effects on this, the thank you, you can measure how many likes there are, how many reposts, and this gives you a very good impression of how competent uh, Lewis is actually in this job. The last thing that people look at very quickly, oh, I'm running out of time, <laughs> is uh, the interests. Interests are very important. Um, the first thing you definitely need to do if you want to apply for a new department or so on is follow that department. Why? Not just because of courtesy, but because if you follow them on your wall on LinkedIn, you see all their news. So it's the minimum of uh, your showing your interest that you read what is happening in that department, right? The next thing is that you should follow groups of interest because they prove how um, competent you are because many of the groups are actually peer-reviewed if you want to um, attend them. So many groups, professional groups, require you to apply, and then there's a person that is an expert in the industry that vets your application. So if you make it into the group, an expert in that field has confirmed that you are actually also uh, an expert in that field. So EIE, um, here's an um, international teaching association that I'm a member of. Of course, Harvard Business Review, if you want to be in a business school. Um, if you go into groups uh, where peers will evaluate you, then you show to your potential employer that you have been vetted by other peers in your domain. The great thing about groups, and this is something that everybody ignores most of the time because nobody tells you, is that automatically if you make it into a group, every member of the group becomes a second level contact to you. That is huge. If you are in a department in a certain discipline and you connect to the group and you get accepted, suddenly the hundreds or thousands or millions of people in that group are second to you that you can contact right away. So as you understand, groups that need the validation are more valuable. With this, you are armed. You have an authentic um, uh, profile that shows who you are and what you can do. And you can here start developing your, um, your network. So the thing is very simple. First off, you develop your personal network. That's literally super simple. It's your family and your friends that you just connect to. Afterwards, you build out your professional network, colleagues, alumni from your college. And afterwards is where you extend your network. So let's go through it quickly. Friends and family, super easy. You go on the people search and you really type their name and find them. Find the ones that are even extended family, friends of your family, and so on. These people, high positions. Why? Because if they are in a good position, they will have a big network. And all these friends that they have will become your seconds and will enlarge your potential to go to the people that you need to connect to. The next step is developing your professional network. So current colleagues, the people around you, find them with a name. Colleagues that are a little bit more extended, you can find them with filters where you literally just filter, for example, for second connections. Now that you have a few people and access to all their friends, you can go and see is there who is the second connection working at the University of California, Berkeley, or in my department. And if I do that, I just see a large collection of people that are there and that I can connect to. And they are likely to accept it because they're seconds. So through the friend, plus it's a work connection. So they are likely to accept me. Alumni is the same thing. I use the school filter. I use the University of Freiburg where I was, the University of Sorbonne where I was. And I try to just connect to as many people as I can. I'm very early on in my network building. So it's about growth. It's about getting access to friends of friends. Most of the people I connect at this point, I will not know. Nobody cares. From there on, I can start becoming strategic and target by combining filters. So if I combine my workplace, my current company, with my schools, I find 11 people that went to either one of my uh, college or universities and that work at Berkeley. These people are super likely to accept my invitation wherever they work. 
And again, I don't care where they work. I know that they work at Berkeley, so they will have a lot of other connections at Berkeley. My aim is to connect to John or Rob. Somehow I need to get connected. So these guys are very likely to accept my invitation. From there, I can drop my alumni affiliation and start focusing on, for example, the field that I'm working in. So in this case, education management. So I say, once I'm connected to these 11 people and I get access to all their friends at Berkeley, I'm now searching for University of California Berkeley people that are working in my same industry. So education management. I look for the same industry because they are likely to accept my invitation, even if they're not alumni or we are not alumni from the same institution. So I find 873. I'm not going to invite 873 people to my network. That's too much. I can't spend hours on this. What I do is I will actually use keywords. And this is one of the hidden uh, um, gems in the filters. If you scroll all the way down, you'll find this field. And in this field, you can put in a title. And so if I filter for second connections that work at Berkeley, and work in education management and are on the manager level, I find 12 people. That is a very good um, set of people that I can connect to. And these people, if they have all these common points, are likely to connect with me. And because that they are at a manager level, they are likely to be connected to the higher ups as well. So what would be my next step if I want to go to Rob or John after I connect to the manager level? I can target specifically the managers in the department I'm interested in. So for example, let's say, well, this is engineering that I took here in this example, but to get a little bit, uh, give a break to Inform School of Information or College of Letters and Sciences. But imagine I wanted to look for a position at the, in engineering. I can target by choosing that specific department. I can choose the industry to work in. So that is the education management. And I can look for job title there as well. So I'm really zoning in on where I want to work. And once I have, for example, manager level, which I know are connected to the higher ups, I can be a little bit bolder. And then here as keyword, for example, put in dean <laughs> instead of manager. And then at the School of Information, people that I'm connected to find Catherine, who I'm actually already con uh, in contact now. So from starting off by just randomly connecting to people that have a reason to connect with me or they are likely to accept my invitation, I can use these filters strategically to step by step zone in on the department that I actually want to apply to, the level of people that are important in that department and that are likely to be connected to the top people and then from there connect to the top people. And so a good question is, do you send a message when you connect to people? You, there are two strategies. The reality is sending a message oftentimes engages them in the discussion. If you have nothing to say to them, I don't. Like if it's really just <laughs> I need you as a pass through, I'm honest about that. It is about trading networks. And this is why you need to do a good job as much as possible in this first part, where you build your professional network and your personal network, try to get over 500 connections with just connecting to people that will accept. Your alumni, your colleagues, your families, your friends. Try to grow it from there over a time frame of about two to three months. Over 500, um, if you hit over 500 usually, that is where people will just say, oh, you have a strong network. I will just accept your invitation just for that. And that's where you come into this third level here that I showed at the beginning, the extended network. These people will just be interested in you because you have a strong network, because maybe you're connected into uh, key groups. Um, I want access to your network because it helps me. So I will accept your invitation. And I know that I will never meet you, see you, or talk to you. This is what I was describing earlier as the trading platform. At the end, once you have a very strong network, 
LinkedIn becomes much more of a trade network, a trade platform where you say, hey, this is my network. I'm interested in your network or people in your network. Do you want to exchange? Do you want to share? And that's what it ends up being. So I wanted to give a demo, but I'm a little bit over time. So I would say thank you so much for your attention. Um, I ran a little bit through the last part, but you got the most important message at the beginning. It's really about putting out yourself in an authentic way so that people will want to connect to you. On that basis, you built your first network of trustees, of alumni, of colleagues, and from there you'll have what you need to strategically grow your network step by step into the departments where you want to apply to. Do you even recommend the membership? Um, the recommendation for paying for membership, I would totally, if you say I'm doing this, go for the one month free. So I'm not from LinkedIn, right? So haha. <laughs> go for the one month free. Um, and don't choose the cheapest option, right? So it's free. You can use the full package because you're going to stop it afterwards. And then during that month for free with the full package, the most expensive package, you get unlocked from limitations of number of um, requests you can make. Otherwise, if you're on the free version, somehow it blocks you at some point. They say, well, you can't see more people to connect to. Um, small uh, workaround is that do it from your app. Um, on your app, you can actually, there's no limitation. You can just keep going um, to connect. So I would do the free definitely, and if you see it's worth it, then you can do more. If you're a hiring manager, I would totally do it actually, because you can use it very extensively also to hunt for people. Yes? Um, I, I wouldn't recommend a specific company to optimize your keywords. They are really out there um, and you can find them quite easily on your own and it depends a little bit on the industries that you want to work with. Um, some companies are really specialized in certain industries. But it, for them it's very easy because what they do is they scrape um, basically the internet or they know the algorithms that search. Honestly, if this is for your career development within Berkeley, I don't know of any AI that Berkeley would have <laughs> to analyze uh, applications yet. Um, on the other hand, it's the same thing. I'm very confident that the people you want to work for, like the managers, they are looking at your LinkedIn profile. Like it's a, it's a no-brainer. And so it's part of that development that you, or part of what you need to do most. Other question? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. The, uh, so the question is basically, on which grounds do you not connect with somebody? And I mean, for me, it's the same thing. If I look at my network, for example, um, here, I, I always have, oh, okay, network connection is off. I, I usually have like about 100 people that I, I don't accept that are somehow in the queue and that I'm waiting on. Um, what I'm waiting on to connect with is um, our day either at a level of professionalism where I see there's a benefit to me, so do they have a network that I will profit from? Um, or are they really working in my industry and so it is good for me to connect with them because there will be some interaction in for real. So it's those two trading points really. The worst thing for me personally is somebody says, I'm actively looking for an opportunity. Well, if that is your main activity and this is what you want to put out, is that you're not happy in your job, then I'm not interested. I'm interested in high performers that are good in their job, that the company is not wanting to leave. And, uh, and I want the person who figures it out, not somebody who puts on LinkedIn, hey, find me. So that doesn't total no-go for me if somebody puts that out, but yeah. Yeah. N not really. Actually, I've never seen that happen unless people drop out so you can withdraw your um, application. That's something you should do if you go out and mass connect basically to people at the beginning. I usually 
leave those connections standing. So there's a part where you go for your network management. You see what invitations you have sent. And I usually delete or withdraw my, uh, my invitations I send after four weeks. Because if they don't reply after four weeks, um, there's no point. I don't want to bother them anymore. Uh, obviously, they're, they're not interested in connecting. And also, if that, like, you don't want to have tens of thousands of people that you invited in your stock, LinkedIn at some point will block you. Yeah, people will look you up. Like, at, at least I see it from the, that is my millennial perspective on it, uh, or Gen Y perspective on it. It's like, I do not want to work for somebody who wouldn't look up my, my LinkedIn. This is like, duh, of course, uh, you do that. Um, so in that sense, I would totally put it on my resume. I would invite people to it if you have a profile where you can actually show your portfolio. So I think that is a key part of it. Um, if you feel confident that you really built something that reflects yourself correctly, and if you're bold enough to put that out, put it out. So um, the question is, when should a student or a young person start having LinkedIn? Is it high school? Is it undergrad? Um, I would say as soon as possible with the caveat of knowing that you need the maturity to have a good profile. So if you are not yourself in a place where you are able to do that level of introspection, uh, the likelihood is big that you will actually put something out there which is harmful <laughs> to, your, to your career um, rather than anything else. And I see it a lot and it pains me a lot because LinkedIn was really a professional network up to now the Gen Z's moving in and it is becoming a whole pest with uh, like influential motivational posts and so on and people just doing Instagram on LinkedIn. They don't realize to what point they're actually shooting themselves in the foot and how it doesn't work because the AIs pick up on that, the frequency of postings, of likes, of reposting, that's like a total no-go. Um, the, the, the types of postings that you make. Um, if you're an Instagrammer on LinkedIn, I think there's a good likelihood that you won't actually get the job. Yeah. So Berkeley was a little bit different because, or at least in my, in my last positions, um, they always came about in a way where I was in touch with the institution through some uh, interaction. So in this case, I was working in France, organizing custom programs from there with Berkeley here. And it was an interaction where I got to know the people in real life. Um, in our department, um, LinkedIn is not particularly used in a strategic way by HR. It's up to the different managers to use it for recruitment. So I was connected because I used this, obviously, to a lot of people before I even touched uh, base. Um, I don't think it was a criterion that uh, in my department was key because the people that hired me are not that much uh, the heavy LinkedIn users. <laughs> yeah. So I hope this helped a little bit. Um, again, the, the thing at the end of the day is don't feel any um, shame of connecting to people that you don't know and that you will never see or talk to. Just realize that um, this is not a social network as much as it is a platform where you can actually offer something to other people as a trade, which is your network. So your first focus when you build your network is build a high quality network through your, your close connections and then from there start trading and zoom in to those different filters. And you'll actually love it. I just showed you a few of them. Um, I wanted to show you more, but basically it's up here in the corner, if you click on all filters here, this is all the different filters you can use. So there's a lot that you can um, cross-reference here, combine to 
go closer and closer to the people, the departments that you want to apply to. And uh, if you have a good network, people will just accept your invitations. And there's obviously nothing bad about just writing, hey, I'd actually love to be connected. I showed you earlier a connection that I found while preparing this talk. Um, where is he? I'll end on this note. I found Martin. Um, Martin is an alum from my university in Freiburg in Germany. Um, and guess what? He's a visiting scholar here, and he's working on entrepreneurship and engineering. And I'm just building out a new entrepreneurship program. So I'm, oh, cool. Uh, looked at his profile. So my invite to him was definitely, hey, I see we're from the same uni, and I see you work on entrepreneurship, and I'm designing a new entrepreneurship program. We should have a coffee. So that's totally, of course, possible. And through this, you meet amazing people. So before I let you go, last thing. Download the LinkedIn app if you don't have it. And if you have it, use it now to connect because this is your chance once a year, the Now Conference. And I just wanted to point something out to you. You won't see it, but in the upper corner, the right corner of this search bar, there are four mysterious little squares. These squares are a copy that LinkedIn has done of the WeChat um, QR code. So you don't need to put in your name or say, oh, I will look you up and so on, blah, blah, do it right there. <laughs> like, download the app, there's your thing. You go in the search part up here, mysterious gray boxes, you click on them, you can scan a code of another person or show your own code like WeChat and then get your connection right away. Okay, so thank you very much for, for attending and start connecting.